December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. In a matter of hours, the battleships of the US Pacific Fleet were destroyed. More than four and a half thousand American servicemen were killed or wounded. Within 24 hours, the United States of America had declared war on Japan. For 50 years, historians have tried to understand how such a massive and carefully planned attack could have come as a total surprise. Recently, new and disturbing questions have been raised about the events which led to tragedy at Pearl Harbor. Did American naval intelligence decode secret Japanese messages warning of an imminent attack and fail to tell President Roosevelt or warn local commanders? Did the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill know of the Japanese plan and keep silent, hoping that the raid would drag America into the war and save Britain from defeat? A wall of official secrecy has surrounded the attack on Pearl Harbor. A congressional inquiry and scores of independent researchers have been met with lies, half-truths and evasions. But now, new testimony has emerged which may at last solve one of the most baffling mysteries of the Second World War. This new evidence comes from two men uniquely placed to penetrate the secretive and complex world of wartime code-breaking. The first, British writer and researcher James Rusbridger, is an authority on the world's intelligence agencies. The second, Eric Knave, was a top codebreaker with the British Royal Navy and head of a section which specialized in the interception and translation of secret Japanese naval messages. In 1989, the British government, fearing Knave's revelations, made a concerted effort to ban the publication of his memoirs. Nave and Rusbridger claim that in 1941, both the American and British intelligence services could read the secret codes used by the Japanese Navy, something denied for decades by both countries. If their revelations are correct, then the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor could have been predicted. What went wrong? Why was no warning given? And why was the Japanese fleet not trapped and destroyed? Nave and Rusbridger maintain that the key to these riddles lies in the secret history of wartime code breaking. The first Japanese message ever decoded by US Army intelligence was a diplomatic telegram from the Japanese foreign ministry to its Washington embassy translated on June the 12th, 1920. The decoding effort soon paid off. Throughout the 1922 Washington Conference on Disarmament, at which reductions in the world's navies were negotiated, the Americans were intercepting and decoding Japanese diplomatic signals. American delegates always knew the Japanese bargaining position in advance and could constantly outmaneuver their opponents. In 1930, the U.S. Army's code-breaking unit was reorganized and given the name the Signals Intelligence Service, SIS. Its chief was the genius code-breaker William F. Friedman. Gradually, Friedman's group began to master a number of foreign diplomatic codes, including the latest Japanese systems. While the American Army concentrated on decoding Japanese diplomatic messages, the U.S. Navy was attempting to break Japanese naval codes. The first breakthrough had come in 1921, when the Japanese consulate in New York had been burgled by naval intelligence, helped by the FBI and the New York Police Department. Night after night, the burglars had returned until they'd photographed every page of the Japanese naval code. The break-ins were repeated in 1926 and 1927. The US Navy code-breaking agency was known as OP-20G. 
At first, it had a staff of only seven. But the shortage of personnel in itself led to a great breakthrough. With the help of the Underwood typewriter company, a machine was invented which would transcribe Morse code into Japanese symbols and their English letter equivalents, ready for decoding. The device was a major time saver and a significant advance in the art of signals intelligence. In the Britain of the 1920s and 30s, all intelligence gathering was coordinated by a single civilian agency, the Government Code and Cipher School, GCCS. First headed by Alistair Denniston, GCCS was part of the Secret Intelligence Service MI6 and was controlled by the British Foreign Office in London. It was so secret that even the British Parliament was unaware of its existence. By 1925, the agency had broken the diplomatic codes of both the United States and France. But equally important to the British, with their many colonies in Asia, was the code used by the Japanese Navy. The man delegated to handle the interception and decoding of Japanese communications was Eric Nave, then a young Australian naval officer. In 1925, Nave was transferred to the British Royal Navy because of his skill in the Japanese language. He was based on a British warship stationed in the British colony of Hong Kong. And over the next two years, he used the radio operators of dozens of British ships to intercept Japanese messages. Nave soon proved himself a talented code breaker. By 1927, thanks to Nave's work, GCCS was able to read all the Japanese naval codes then in existence. All messages sent from Tokyo to Japanese warships and signals sent from warship to warship could be decoded with ease. The following year, Nave was recalled to Britain and ordered to set up a Japanese naval section at GCCS. Permanent interception stations and a decoding center were established in Singapore and Hong Kong. These would later play a key role in warning the British of the Japanese plan to attack Pearl Harbor. In 1934, with the beginning of the Japanese war against China, Japanese military radio traffic increased dramatically. The war provided British eavesdropping stations with a wealth of intercepted radio and telegraph messages. For the codebreakers of GCCS, it was the perfect training ground. Soon, the British knew of every Japanese military move before it happened. They knew the intended place of each attack, the army units deployed, the precise number of warships and transports allocated to each operation, and details of the routes the attackers would take to reach their objectives. So that their ability to break Japanese codes should remain a secret, the British did not tell China of the attacks they knew were coming. This was in spite of the fact that China was Britain's ally. In the near future, the United States of America would be the victim of a similarly cynical betrayal. The American code-breaking operation was very different from the British effort in the way it was organized. Intelligence functions, instead of being concentrated in one agency, were divided between the Army and Navy. In 1937, the Army codebreakers of SIS had guessed that a new Japanese machine for encoding diplomatic messages was based on the Strouger switches used in telephone exchanges. They named the code Purple. In an amazing demonstration of ingenuity, they first broke the Purple code and then built a copy of the machine without ever having seen the original. It was one of the greatest code-breaking achievements in history. The army was now set to decode the latest Japanese diplomatic signals on their copies of purple machines. 
a list of 13 people who were to receive material from the decoding of purple messages was now drawn up. The list did not include the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt. It would be January 1941 before Roosevelt was reluctantly given access to purple material. Even then, some would still be withheld. Ironically, the Army was itself being kept in the dark about a code-breaking achievement. The Navy had told neither Army intelligence nor President Roosevelt that it had been breaking Japanese naval codes. Inter-service rivalry and mistrust of the President now virtually guaranteed that decisions vital to the security of the United States would be based on totally inadequate information. March 1939, the German occupation of Czechoslovakia. If any doubted Hitler's appetite for conquest, those doubts had now been dramatically dispelled. But while the eyes of the world were fixed on Europe, the Japanese could concentrate on consolidating their gains in China. They also introduced a new naval code, called by the Americans JN-25. Around the breaking of this code revolves the mystery of the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. In Britain, GCCS, the Government Code and Cipher School, had moved to a new top secret headquarters at Bletchley Park. There, in dozens of prefabricated huts, large numbers of personnel carried out the laborious task of reconstructing the JN-25 codebook. By the end of 1939, the code was well and truly broken. By September 1940, US Navy codebreakers had also produced their first translations of Japanese naval messages sent in the JN-25 code. By January 1941, the solution was still incomplete, but remarkable progress had been made. Meanwhile, the countdown to Pearl Harbor had already begun. On September the 1st, 1939, Hitler's army stormed into Poland. By July of the following year, France and the Low Countries had fallen. It seemed only a matter of time before Britain herself was invaded by the German army or starved into submission by the U-boat wolf packs. The new British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, knew quite clearly that British survival depended on one thing and one thing only, America's entry into the war. Since the Japanese attack on China, relations between the United States and Japan had been strained by America's imposition of trade restrictions. The Japanese knew that with oil imports cut off, they could not survive for long. If no negotiated settlement could be reached, war with the United States would be the inevitable result. The only question was when and how. On November the 11th, 1940, the British aircraft carrier Illustrious launched a force of 21 torpedo bombers to attack the Italian fleet at its home port of Toronto. For the loss of only two British aircraft, three Italian battleships were disabled leaving the Italian Navy a crippled force. The commander-in-chief of the Japanese combined fleet, Admiral Yamamoto, was greatly impressed by the British raid on Toronto. By April 1941, Yamamoto had laid his plans for Operation Z, an attack on the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. If successful, the raid would leave the United States powerless in the Pacific. Yamamoto firmly believed that the Americans would never expect such a move. And yet, in 1938, the US Navy had itself demonstrated that such an attack could succeed by carrying out an exercise in which carrier-launched aircraft attacked Pearl Harbor. In March 1941, the commanders of Hawaii's air defenses had also warned Washington that a surprise dawn raid on Pearl Harbor launched from Japanese aircraft carriers was a real possibility. The American Secretary of State, 
Henry Stimson, was quick to heed these warnings. He ordered increased anti-aircraft defenses, radar cover, and more fighters to Pearl Harbor. But the real problem Stimson faced was that Pearl Harbor was only one of several possible targets. What was needed was some kind of advance intelligence warning of exactly where any Japanese attack would come. Information that could only be gleaned from intercepting secret Japanese messages. On September the 24th, 1941, the Japanese Foreign Office in Tokyo instructed its consul in Honolulu to collect and supply intelligence on Pearl Harbor. The request divided the harbor into target segments and asked for precise details of the ships moored in each area. No other United States facility had ever been targeted in this way. The Japanese message was intercepted by the U.S. Army's listening station at Oahu. But all intercepts had to be passed on to Washington for decoding, and to save expense, they were sent by surface mail. It was two weeks before Washington received the intercept. The decoded signal was interpreted by U.S. Army intelligence as being of little importance and no translations of the message were ever sent to local commanders in Hawaii. If in the coming weeks the army had known of the movements of the Japanese Navy, they might have taken the Pearl Harbor spying order a great deal more seriously. But US Navy intelligence had still not told the army that it could read the Japanese naval code. By November the 16th, 1941, Admiral Yamamoto's task force was assembling at a secret island rendezvous off Japan. The force was made up of six aircraft carriers, two battleships, two heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and nine destroyers. Each commander had 50 pages of orders, but the final three instructions were not included. Those detailing the date of sailing, the date set for mid-ocean refueling, and the date of the attack itself. Because of ongoing peace negotiations between Japanese envoys and the US State Department, the attack might, after all, prove unnecessary. So the final parts of Yamamoto's orders were to be sent to the fleet by radio in the JN-25 Naval Code. On November the 20th, British intelligence intercepted and decoded a JN-25 message from Yamamoto to his task force. The message read, at 0 hundred hours on 21st November, carry out second phase for opening hostilities. The fleet was to prepare to sail. On November the 25th, the British intercepted messages from Yamamoto to his fleet that suggested where the attack would take place. The date for sailing was to be the 26th of November. And on December the 4th, the fleet was to halt for refueling. To British intelligence, the date for refueling indicated a very long-range mission. Yet neither Singapore, Manila, nor Java, the most likely long-range targets, needed to be attacked from aircraft carriers. These were all in easy reach of bombers stationed in China. That left an attack due east in the Pacific. The only Pacific target of sufficient importance was Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The US Navy must have intercepted and decoded exactly the same signals as the British. Yet somewhere along the way, there was a catastrophic failure to interpret them correctly. What is certain is that neither the president nor the commanders at Pearl Harbor were told anything. For months, British intelligence had been plotting the movements of all Japanese merchant ships. It was clear that they were heading slowly but surely back to Japan. Plainly, the Japanese government had no intention of allowing its ships to be impounded in foreign ports when war broke out. British intelligence calculated that the Japanese merchant fleet would be in home waters by the first week of December. 
they concluded that war would break out any time from December the 5th. On December the 2nd, the British intercepted and decoded the third message from Yamamoto to his task force. It read, climb Nitakayama 1208. Nitakayama was the highest mountain peak in the Japanese empire. To climb it was seen as a great feat of daring. It was clearly the instruction to attack. 1208 referred to the eighth day of December, Tokyo time. That information, like all other JN-25 messages intercepted by British listening stations, was sent to London with a request that it should be passed on to the Americans. In fact, the Americans were being told nothing. The decision not to tell the United States that a Japanese task force was steaming for its main Pacific base could have been taken by only one man. That man was the British Prime Minister. Winston Churchill. Even if Churchill was betraying the United States and his friend Roosevelt, did the Americans really need to be told of Japanese movements when they had interception stations and codebreakers of their own? To this day, the question cannot be answered with certainty. In US naval archives, the very few JN-25 intercepts which survive from before Pearl Harbor bear decoding dates of 1945 or later, implying that at the time of the attack, the code had not yet been broken. These dates appear to be forged. What is known is that one key message at least was the subject of a later cover-up. In November 1941, US Army intelligence had intercepted and decoded a message from Tokyo to its embassies abroad telling them that if the words East Wind Rain were heard on the Japanese overseas radio service, they would indicate an impending clash with the United States. On December the 4th, as Yamamoto's fleet closed on its target, Japanese radio broadcast the code phrase in its weather forecasts. The message was intercepted by senior radio operator Ralph Biggs at the US Navy intercept station at Cheltenham in Maryland. At once, it was passed on to both Navy and Army intelligence and the White House. Because only the Navy knew of Yamamoto's messages to his fleet, no one drew the correct conclusions. Soon after Pearl Harbor, the cover-up would begin. All copies of the message would be removed from official files and destroyed. Pressure would be put on Navy personnel to deny that the Japanese radio broadcasts had ever been monitored. On December the 6th, 1941, Tokyo sent a long signal to its ambassadors in Washington answering the latest American peace proposals. The message, sent in the diplomatic purple code, was translated by army intelligence and given to Roosevelt that evening. His reaction was to pronounce, this means war. But exactly how war would come, he was in no position to guess. He still had not been told about the Navy's ability to decode Yamamoto's JN-25 messages. Without information on Japanese naval movements, the diplomatic intercepts were meaningless. It was impossible to identify Pearl Harbor as the likely target or to know the exact date of the attack. In fact, the raid on Pearl Harbor was only hours away. December the 7th, U.S. time, the first bombs fell on Pearl Harbor. 
as the news was flashed to Washington and to military bases all over the United States. The staff of the Maryland Listening Center, who had intercepted the East Wind Rain warning message, were astonished. They had believed that their report to Washington would have guaranteed that the United States would be prepared. Instead, something had gone profoundly wrong. At the British Decoding Center in Singapore, news of Pearl Harbor was also greeted with disbelief. It seemed inconceivable that with all the information the decoders believed to have been passed to the Americans, that they should have been taken by surprise. Perhaps the only person who was neither surprised nor horrified was the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. Churchill recalled in his memoirs, being saturated and satiated with emotion and sensation, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and thankful. 